stuff, okay? VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Dan Friedel, and Anna Mateo. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, here is Brian Lynn. The United States has increased its COVID-19 vaccine assistance to Taiwan, sending 2.5 million shots to the island. Doses of the Moderna vaccine arrived in Taiwan on Sunday on a transport airplane belonging to Taiwan's China Airlines. The plane took off from the southern U.S. city of Memphis in Tennessee. The plane was welcomed at the airport outside Taipei by Taiwan's health minister, Chen Shi chung and Brent Christensen, the top U.S. official in Taiwan. Chun said the donation showed the strength of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship at a time when Taiwan faces its most severe COVID-19 outbreak. When I saw these vaccines coming down the plane, I was really touched. Chun told reporters. The U.S. had promised to send Taiwan 750,000 COVID-19 doses this month. However, the administration of U.S. President Joe Biden increased that number as part of an assistance program that aims to provide 500 million vaccine doses worldwide. Taiwan has not been as severely affected by COVID-19 as some of its Asian neighbors, but a rise in cases that started in May has left officials struggling to get vaccines. The Coronavirus Resource Center of Johns Hopkins University reports that Taiwan has recorded 569 deaths from COVID-19. About 6% of Taiwan's 23.5 million people have received at least one vaccine dose. Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, said the U.S. had decided to increase its vaccine donations after negotiations over the past two weeks. The latest U.S. assistance signals support for Taiwan in the face of growing pressure from China. Mainland China considers Taiwan a rebel province and has threatened to reclaim the territory by force if necessary. The U.S. does not have official diplomatic ties with Taiwan because it has relations with the government in Beijing under what is known as the One China policy. However, American law requires the U.S. to assist Taiwan in defending itself. These vaccines are proof of America's commitment to Taiwan, said Christensen, director of the American Institute in Taiwan. Taiwan is a family member to the world's democratic countries, he added. An administration official told Reuters the vaccine doses were not being provided based on political or economic conditions. The assistance is aimed at saving lives, the official said. 
Our vaccines do not come with strings attached, the official added. The official said that Taiwan had faced unfair challenges in its efforts to secure COVID-19 vaccines. Taiwan has accused mainland China of blocking its efforts to get the Pfizer vaccine through BioNTech, the vaccine's German co-developer. Mainland Chinese officials have denied this and said China is willing to provide vaccines to Taiwan. Taiwanese law, however, bans the import of Chinese-made medicine. The U.S. donation follows Japan's shipment to Taiwan of 1.24 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine in early June. Taiwan has ordered 10 million doses from AstraZeneca, but has yet to receive most of them. I'm Brian Lin. Searchers keep making surprising discoveries about the ancient fish called the coelacanth. Scientists believe the fish first appeared 400 million years ago, but they thought it had disappeared completely until a living coelacanth was found off South Africa in 1938. Then, experts thought for many years that the fish only lived to be about 20 years old. That would make the coelacanth one of the fastest growing fish in the ocean. But a recent study found that the ancient fish can live 100 years, meaning earlier estimates were off by a factor of five. The study was published in the journal Current Biology. At first, scientists counted the coelacanth's age based on growth lines on the scales that form the fish's outer covering. Counting the growth lines gave earlier scientists the 20-year age estimate. However, a group of scientists at France's Marine Research Institute decided to look at the scales under a special polarized light. This method is used to find out the age of fish sold for food. The researchers realized that for every large line, there were five smaller lines. They said the smaller lines matched up better to one year of the fish's growth. The scientists said the oldest specimen they have is 84 years old. Some fish grow to be about 2 meters long, and they can weigh 90 kilograms or more. That means the coelacanth is one of the slowest growing fish in the ocean. The scientists also studied two preserved embryos. They found that female coelacanths carry babies for at least five years before giving birth. The female fish are not able to have babies until they are over 50 years old. Harold Walker is an ocean expert who did not work on the study. He described the discovery about the embryos as very strange. Because the fish are endangered, scientists can only study ones that are already dead and preserved they are not permitted to catch live fish. After being rediscovered in waters off South Africa, coelacanths have mostly been found in the Indian Ocean, close to Africa. I'm Dan Friedel.
From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. On a recent sunny day, hikers stood at an entry point on the Appalachian Trail near Hawk Mountain in the U.S. state of Pennsylvania. Some rested and drank water. As they prepared to continue hiking on the 3,508 kilometer walking path, the Appalachian Trail stretches from Maine in the north to Georgia in the south. One of the hikers is Mario Kovac, a war veteran. On his right arm are the last names of many soldiers permanently written or tattooed. Soulsby, Bell, Schwartz, Seidler, Miller, Moss, just to name a few. They were all members of the U.S. Air Force Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit, and they all died in battle. They had the dangerous job of defusing bombs. That was also Kovac's job for 20 years in the Air Force. Kovac retired in 2018. He served five tours of duty in Afghanistan without serious injury to his body. However, his mental health suffered. So he has been treating his mental health on the trail and in other places in nature. He shared his experiences of healing on the trails with a reporter from the Associated Press. Nature is nothing that man controls, Kovac said. He added that it is both the natural environment and the peace and quiet that has helped him heal. Cindy Ross is a writer and lifelong hiker. Her latest book is Walking Toward Peace, Veterans Healing on America's Trails. It is about the veterans Ross serves through the nonprofit organization called Riverhouse PA. Her experience with some veterans who through hiked the trail in 2013 led her to start the organization. Through hiked means they walked the whole 3,508 kilometers. Ross describes the organization and its surrounding natural environment as places where veterans and others suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, can heal. PTSD is a condition affecting soldiers who have experienced extreme conditions in war. But it develops in anyone who has experienced a shocking, scary, or dangerous event. PTSD involves reliving the trauma over and over. It includes physical responses like a fast heartbeat. People suffering from PTSD may have bad dreams and frightening thoughts. They can also be easily surprised, feel tense, have trouble sleeping, and have angry outbursts. One study suggests that as many as 30% of veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan suffer from PTSD. Many Vietnam veterans are still affected. Veterans also take their own lives in greater numbers than the general population. Suicides in the military have been called an epidemic. The Department of Veterans Affairs says in 2018, Nearly 18 veterans committed suicide every day. The number of those who have killed themselves has gone down among veterans who have received care through the department. However, experts say much work remains to be done. 
Kovac is among the veterans Ross wrote about in her book. The men and women had extreme experiences. In many cases, they were close to suicide before discovering the healing power of nature. Ross worked with the Veterans Agency, and word spread about the program. Besides hiking the trails, activities include different types of boating. Paralyzed veterans can ride specialized mountain bikes on the trails. And at the end of the day's activities, they all meet to have dinner together around a fire. At least a few of them would start to cry and say it was the best day of my life, Ross said. They also say to Ross that they need to do this with their family and children. The veterans often tell her a day in nature was what saved their lives. Last fall, Kovac helped start Project Felix. It is a nonprofit group for soldiers who are dealing with survivor's guilt and other conditions. He said the goal is to reduce military suicides. He said there are other ways to heal, but a day in the woods, or a week, or a month, is among the best. It doesn't cost anything, he said. You are not putting medications into you. And you can do it any time. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Ulysses S. Grant. He took office in 1869. But his presidency is not what made him famous. Grant is best remembered for being the commander of Union forces at the end of the Civil War. He led the United States to victory over the Confederate States of America. Many Americans also remember Grant because of the unusual story about his middle initial. When the future 18th president was born, his parents named him Hiram Ulysses Grant, but the boy was known as Ulysses. When Grant was a young man, a member of Congress appointed him to a top college the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, New York. The congressman did not know Grant personally. He thought Grant used his mother's family name, Simpson, as his middle name. So the congressman called him Ulysses S. Grant. The middle initial S became official. Years later, Grant joked, that it did not mean anything. During the Civil War, however, Grant's middle name did come to have a popular meaning. In a famous battle in the state of Tennessee, Grant's army overpowered their opponents. The Confederate general sent a note asking for the terms of surrender. In other words, what would the Union army require of them if they withdrew from the battle. General Grant replied, No terms except unconditional and immediate surrender. The answer did not please the Confederate general, but he agreed. In the North, people celebrated the victory. They began saying Grant's first two initials stood for unconditional surrender. Grant was born in the state of Ohio. He was the oldest of six children. Grant's father worked as a tanner, a person who makes leather from animal skin. As a boy, Grant helped his father, 
but he did not like the work. He said he would not do it when he was an adult. So, when Grant was a young man, his father asked West Point officials to admit his son as a student. The Grants had little money to pay for the boy's college education, but they knew he was intelligent and skilled, and West Point was free. In exchange for their education, West Point graduates serve in the military. Grant probably did not seem like a soldier. He was quiet and sensitive. He hated seeing men die in battle, and he questioned the value of war. But he turned out to be an excellent military leader. After he graduated from West Point, he fought in the Mexican War and earned medals for bravery. He was given more power and added responsibilities. However, Grant was lonely. Early in his career, he married Julia Dent, the sister of a college friend. He was devoted to Julia and their four children. But his family could not come with Grant on all his deployments for the military. They were separated for years at a time. Without his family nearby, Grant began having problems with money. Some people said he also drank too much alcohol. One day, Grant resigned from the army. He returned home to his family. At first, he tried to farm, but he could not make enough money. Then he tried other jobs. Finally, he asked his father for help. His father gave him a job, but it was the one the young Grant swore he never wanted, working in a leather shop. Then things took a surprising turn. The Civil War began. The Union needed experienced military leaders. Grant accepted a position leading a difficult group of troops. He was able to train them and earn their respect. Quickly, Grant's public image as a military leader grew. He won major victories for the Union in battles at Fort Donelson, Tennessee, and Vicksburg, Mississippi. The president at the time, Abraham Lincoln, liked the way Grant planned the battles. He also liked that Grant did everything he could to win. Grant permitted so many of his soldiers to die that his critics gave him a nickname, The Butcher. Grant's methods were harsh, but effective. The Civil War effectively ended when the famous Confederate general, Robert E. Lee, surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. The following year, Grant was named General of the U.S. Armies. The only other person to hold that position was the military leader during the Revolutionary War, George Washington. Like George Washington, Grant became president, although he did not really seek the position. But Republican Party leaders realized that the former general was very popular, and they knew that Grant opposed the policies of the president at the time, Andrew Johnson. So the Republicans nominated Grant as their candidate in 1868. He won easily. But Grant's popularity and ability as a military leader did not make him a successful president. Grant tried to work for the political and civil rights of African Americans. 
many of whom had been enslaved. One of Grant's most important acts was to support the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The measure gave African American men the right to vote. At the same time, Grant tried to give states control over their own laws. So, sometimes he used the power of the federal government to protect the rights of African Americans, and he sometimes let states use violence to prevent African Americans from exercising their rights. Grant also spoke about treating Native Americans with greater respect. He used government resources to help Native people become farmers. But other government policies helped white settlers continue to push tribes off their lands. Few Native Americans saw their lives really improve under Grant. Finally, his administration suffered because of corrupt government officials. Grant himself did not get rich from their actions, but he remained loyal to people who worked for him, even when they profited from their position. As a result of all this, many Americans lost interest in Reconstruction and lost faith in the federal government. But Grant himself remained popular. He won a second term more easily than the first. Shortly after, the country entered a bad economic depression. Grant tried to improve the situation by supporting the gold standard. But many Americans, of all backgrounds, continued to suffer. Because of the problems in his government, Grant is not remembered as one of the country's best presidents. But he is remembered as a war hero and as a kind-hearted man with an interesting life. In his last months, Grant worked nearly nonstop on writing his memoirs. Final images show him covered in a blanket and with a pen in his hand, diligently working. Grant died in 1885, a few days after the book was finished. It was a major success. It earned enough money to provide for his family for the rest of their lives. People across the country mourned the loss of Grant. More than a million and a half watched his funeral parade in New York City. He is buried there, along with his beloved wife, in a well-known memorial, popularly called Grant's Tomb. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 